All right, good evening, everybody. Want to uh, welcome everybody to the 2022 West Michigan Grace Bible Conference. It's good to see all of you here. Um, I got sick this week. I was losing my voice in the middle of my sermon last Sunday and took a day off of work, and I'm doing better. I can talk better. The amplification helps, but we're glad to see everybody here. I see some folks we haven't seen since before COVID, which is great, and I see some new people uh, who have come out. Want to welcome you to Grace Life Bible Church. Uh, just a couple quick housekeeping things. Uh, if you are looking for a bathroom, out here in the fellowship hall, there is a single occupancy uh, men's and ladies room on this side of the church. And then if you turn right and go down the hallway, there's a full set of bathrooms down there. There's plenty of snacks and, and refreshments, and et cetera, there in the fellowship hall if you would uh, want to avail yourself of those. Um, we are really excited. Our theme this year is the weapons of our warfare, understanding the nature of our spiritual warfare. We've got two great speakers uh, that we've invited, uh, Brother Dave Reed, who, as you can see, can't spell Michigan. <laughs> that was intentional. That's what people from the South like to do to us up here. But um, <laughs> so Brother Dave Reed is here, and then also uh, Brother Greg Reeser from Kentucky. And I've given these guys an hour. Uh, so Dave will go for an hour, and then we'll take a built-in 15-minute break, and then we'll start again at 745. So Dave, you can start coming up. Uh, Dave Reed is uh, probably one of my best friends. Uh, I've known him for a long time. Appreciate him and his wife, Stephanie, and, and their family and their ministry. Um, Stephanie probably needs some extra pats on the back because I called Dave probably too much. Um, we talk about all sorts of different stuff, but uh, anyway, Dave's going to open up the weekend here with a study, The Weapons of Our Warfare, kind of get the ball rolling, and uh, it's great to have you here as always, Dave. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that warm introduction, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's always a joy. I'm going to kick us off and get started. Uh, the, the topic that I have tonight is the weapons of warfare. And that, the, the theme of, of this conference, obviously, is going to be spiritual warfare. Uh, let me open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father God, thank you for this time. We pray that you would give us understanding as we dig into the scriptures. Help us, Lord, to set aside our own opinions and traditions and instead believe what you have written. We do, we give you all thanks for all things, and it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray, amen. So the theme is spiritual warfare, and I'll start off by saying a lot of the common teaching and thinking on spiritual warfare is very sensationalistic, and here's what I mean by that. I don't know if you've read any books on spiritual warfare, but they'll often have these stories of angels fighting and so there's the good angels with swords of light and the bad angels and they engage in all this combat and they hit each other with swords and it makes for great reading but it makes for poor doctrine and so what one of the things we want to do this weekend is understand how spiritual warfare really works not the sort of common misunderstanding there's a famous book called The Art of War by the philosopher Sun Tzu, and he has a quote that I think is helpful. It is the following. The essence of all warfare is deception. The essence of all warfare is deception. So I'll give you one or two examples of that. What happens on D-Day? What do the Allies do? is the Allies' best general at the point of attack? And the answer is no. It was widely believed and understood that Patton was America's best general. And the Allies understood, if we try to breach at the point where the Germans are prepared, the casualties will be horrific. So what they did with Patton is they put him in a different location so that the Germans would be forced to deploy resources to that location, and then they never attacked. They did that because they wanted the German forces spread out. The more mundane example is what happens when 
the offense in football comes up to the line of scrimmage? Do they yell over to the defense, we're going to run the ball to the right? I mean, it would be idiotic. It would never succeed. Because the essence of all warfare is deception. You can't let the enemy know what you're doing. Now, the reason I tell you all that, as you think about spiritual warfare, guess what your enemy has tried to do? He's tried to deceive you, to confuse you about the nature of how spiritual warfare works. And sadly, most of Christendom has no real understanding of how spiritual warfare operates. Well, we're going to try to fix that this weekend. So, there are three things that I want to cover, and I'll just give you an outline of, of what those are going to be. Number one, we walk in the flesh, but not after the flesh. Two, how to identify strongholds. And three, how the weapons of our warfare work. Number one, we walk in the flesh but not after the flesh. Number two, how to identify strongholds. And number three, how the weapons of our warfare work. So let's start with number one. We walk in the flesh but not after the flesh. Get 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll look at verse 1. 2 Corinthians 10, 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness of and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. What Paul's saying there is that he was humble and he was unassuming in person. But notice verse 2. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. What Paul's saying there is he's writing to them in advance. He's essentially telling them, get your affairs in order so that I don't have to be harsh with you when I'm present. Did Paul have some problems in the past with the Corinthians where they were misbehaving and not doing what they should do? What he's doing here when he he talks about when he says here that I may not be bold when I am present, he, he's hoping that they can have a pleasant conversation rather than a difficult conversation is the idea of verse 2. Now notice verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I want to spend a little time to just make sure we understand what the phrase is in the flesh and after the flesh mean. They do not mean the same thing. So get with me Galatians 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. What I'll suggest to you is that the phrase in the flesh refers to being in the physical body, being physically present. So look at Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When Paul says there, which I now live in the flesh, he's talking about him residing in the physical body that he possessed. Look with me at Philippians 1, verse 21. Philippians 1 and verse 21. 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Well, verse 24 is pretty clear, isn't it? When he's talking about abiding in the flesh, he's talking about remaining on the earth in his physical body. Get with me Colossians 2. Colossians 2, and we'll look at verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, 
and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. He's talking about people who haven't physically seen him. Look at verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Okay, so what have we seen there? The phrase in the flesh always refers to being physically present. It refers to being in the physical body that we have. Now, if you recall, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 said, For though we walk in the flesh, we're physically present, we do not war after the flesh. So what does it mean then to war after the flesh? Get Romans 8 verse 1. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Romans 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We'll come back to that verse in just a minute. Look at verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Notice verse 5, and I think verse 5 is going to give us a definition of what it means to walk after the flesh. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. According to my understanding, best I understand, that's what walking after the flesh is. What is it? Minding the things of the flesh. We're all going to be in the flesh as long as we're on earth because you're going to be in this physical body. But you get to choose what your mind focuses on. Being after the flesh is minding the things of the flesh. Let's read verse 5 and 6. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. That verse right there tells you the difference between being fleshly and in the spirit, doesn't it? It's all about what your mind thinks upon. Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So to state the obvious, what happens if you as a saved person decide to walk after the flesh? And what you do is you mind the things of the flesh. Does that affect your salvation? Obviously not, because your salvation has nothing to do with works. But what it will produce in your life is death. Not second death or going to hell or anything like that, but it will wreak havoc in your spiritual life. Now go back to Romans 8 verse 1 just for a minute. You're probably familiar with this. What, what most modern versions do is they take out the last part of that verse, Romans 8 1b, and they omit it. So they think it should read like this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's where they think the verse should end. And their reasoning is, well, if you're in Christ Jesus, you've been justified, you've been made righteous, so there is no condemnation for you, period, the end. That's, however, not what the Holy Spirit thinks. What the Holy Spirit is saying there, if we read the whole thing, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And what the verse is clearly saying is this. As a saved person, you can't lose your salvation. You're eternally secure. You have confidence of that. There's no reason to have any doubt about that. But are you going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ? And the answer is, yes, you are. That's a real thing. And your work is going to be evaluated there. And the sad reality is that for many believers, they are going to suffer condemnation at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not going to affect their salvation, but you can't walk after the flesh and think there's not a consequence to it. There is at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what the verse is talking about. Romans 8.1 is not an eternal security verse. It's talking about the fact that you can avoid condemnation at the judgment seat of Christ by walking after the Spirit. So th 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 that's just an illustration there, an example of why you don't want to change the word of God. You don't want to omit parts of it because it'll, it'll mess up your doctrine. So what have we seen so far about this? 
We walk in the physical body, but we are not supposed to think about things according to the flesh. And I'm just going to suggest to you this. The most important issue in life, that issue which affects every aspect of your life, is how you think. It's not stuff that happens to you. It's not external things. It's not even things like health. It's not things like finances. It's not exterior things. It's what happens inside your mind that determines what your life is like. We'll talk more about that. So let's go to point number two, how to identify strongholds. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So let's start with the first half of that verse. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So that obviously means our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are spiritual in nature. And what we know about those weapons is that they're mighty. They're sufficiently powerful to pull down strongholds. So what are those strongholds? The Greek word for strongholds is G3794 in Strong's. It's ahurama. That word is nowhere else in the New Testament. It appears in one verse. So going to the Greek isn't going to help you very much in understanding what that verse means. I think strongholds is defined by the very next verse. So look with me at verse 5. And I'm going to read verses 4 and 5 together so you get the flow of it. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now notice verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I think when you read verses 4 and 5 together, the definition of strongholds is that it is imaginations, it's every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God's imaginations. So get Genesis 6 verse 5. And what we'll do is we'll look at the, the first three verses in Scripture on imaginations. Genesis 6, verse 5. Genesis chapter 6. Of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So what was the state of man before the flood? His thought process is just completely and utterly corrupt. It's only evil, and then what's the adverb? Continually. Well, some will say, well, that was before the flood. But what about after the flood? Look at Genesis 8, 21. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. This is after the flood. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither again will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. See, Genesis 8, 21 tells you that man's thinking didn't change after the flood, did it? It's evil from his what? Youth. See, that's the teenager problem right there, isn't it? Man's thinking is evil from his youth. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I'm sure you have. There's a lot of focus in education on telling people, you need to use your imagination, right? What does the Bible tell you about your imagination? It's only evil continually. You don't need a mind that is dominated by your imagination. You need a mind that's dominated by the Word of God. Look at Genesis 11, verse 6. Genesis 11, verse 6. 
this is the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11:6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, the idea there is what happens is if, if all of these humans, these men are together and there's nothing to restrain them, they'll just act out their imagination and that would be horrific. So what God does is he, he decentralizes power, right? He creates the nations and therefore places some limitation on the evil imaginations of man. So what have we seen? Man's imagination, man's thinking is completely evil. It is veiled by discretion. What do I mean by that? Have you ever had the experience of talking to someone and thinking, this person's an idiot? <laughs> and what happens is you typically don't say that because you don't want to provoke an argument or worse, right? What happens is we veil our thoughts. You don't see all of my thoughts, or you would think even less of me than you do. Same with you, isn't it? You know the problem with children? What, you know what children do? Let's say you're over at someone's house, and dinner is served, and it's terrible. The adults know to say, this is wonderful. What do the children do? They tell it like it is. Children have not let yet learned that you can't vocalize everything you think. Being in polite society means there's a lot of things you think that you don't say. Okay? So I've proven the point a couple different ways, but here's what I want you to get, and you know this. Fundamentally what happens is there is a total difference or can be, between what you see externally and what's going on on the inside. You do that every day. You don't say everything you think or you wouldn't keep your job, right? You wouldn't keep your friends. So we learn to do that. But understand, irrespective of what you see externally, the real part of a person, that which accurately represents their life, is internal. Okay? Now, let's apply that to strongholds. Strongholds, we know, are imaginations. They're every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And I'm going to suggest to you the way to think about strongholds is that they are recurring ingrained evil thought patterns. So let me give you an example of what I think it's not. Let's say we're in a crowd and someone steps on my foot and I get angry and frustrated with this person. Well, that's probably just an episodic thing. But if I fly into rage every day, at someone, then it's a, th it's a pattern of behavior. It's recurring. It's ingrained. What, what ends up happening is everyone is angry at some point in time, but there are some people that are always angry. What I'm going to suggest to you is that what a stronghold is, is it's a recurring, ingrained evil thought pattern. So get with me Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And we'll look at verse 19. And I'm going to suggest to you, this is how you can identify those strongholds in your life. What I'm going to do in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, is 
I'm going to read you these verses, and it's going to be a list of sins. Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Now here's what I'll suggest to you. Whenever we read a list of sins like that, there's another list in Ephesians 5, there's another list in 1 Corinthians 3, there's another list in Revelation 21, so on. What happens when you read that list? You tell me if this is wrong. You go through that list and some of those sting you more than others. Because you know, you know, I read murders and I think, whew, good. I got a lot of other problems, but at least I haven't done that, you know, actually, right? So there's a couple like, yeah, I don't mind that one. I can preach on that all day long, right? And then there's other ones where you read and you know, that's a problem in my life, right? And so if you want to know the strongholds in your life, all you have to do is read Galatians 5, read Ephesians 5, read 1 Corinthians 6, read Revelation 21, read those lists of sins, the ones that pop to your mind, that's, that's where the strongholds in your life are. And, 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 and to be even further honest with you, you already know right now what they are, don't you? We do. The thing, I, I'm always amused at the folks that think they've reached a point of sanctification and, and they're beyond all this. I wish they were right. I would ask them to tell me the secret. The, the problem is that we remain in this flesh, sin resides in our flesh, and we have this constant struggle to how to overcome it. I, I think that's the reality of it. So that's how you can identify the strongholds in your life. So now let's get to start looking at what some of the answers are, and we'll spend a lot of the weekend on this. So number three, how the weapons of our warfare work. So in 2 Corinthians 10.4, it describes, let's just go ahead and read it, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. One thing I think we should notice as we think about the weapons of our warfare, I often think, maybe you do too, that a weapon is an offensive device. So like a, a sword or a club or a rifle. When you look up the word weapon in the 1828, the first definition is any instrument of offense, which obviously would be you know, an instrument of offense. The third definition is an instrument of defense. That's, I wasn't aware of that until I looked at that, meaning that when the word weapon is used, it can have both an offensive connotation and it can have a defensive connotation. One of the reasons I think that matters is as you think about the weapons of our warfare, what are the instruments of offense and the instruments of defense that are available to the body of Christ? And as you think about the, that, one of the things that probably first pop into your head would be Ephesians 6, where it talks about the armor of God. And so we're going to look at the armor of God extensively this weekend. But let's, uh, let's do something briefly now. So this is the different pieces of armor. And so what I've done is you can see the verse there, and then you can see the different pieces of armor. There's the loins girt about with truth the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of spirit, the word of God. I don't know if this is your experience. When I've read about the armor of God in the past, some of the teaching that I've read will talk about, for example, the helmet of salvation. And it'll say, well, the helmet protects the head, and so it protects this. And some of the analysis will be based upon understanding how 
a particular piece of armor applies to a particular body part in terms of protecting it. I question whether that is the right way to think about that. Let me show you why. So let's look at the breastplate. We'll start there. What is the nature of the breastplate? Well, if you look at Ephesians 6, verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So the breastplate is obviously righteousness, as described in Ephesians 6, 14. But compare that with 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and fern helmet the hope of salvation. Have you ever seen someone put on armor? Do they wear two breastplates? Be kind of cumbersome, wouldn't it? You really don't wear two breastplates. So what is the breastplate? Is it righteousness? Or is it faith and love? Let's look at something else. So let's look at faith for a minute. Ephesians 6.16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And you, of course, know what a shield is. You hold it in your hand and you use it to fend off attacks. So in Ephesians 6, we have the shield of faith. But look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Well, is faith a shield or is it a breastplate? Is it both? Is there more than one breastplate? What about righteousness? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. 2 Corinthians 6 describes righteousness as gauntlets, something that you wear on your hand like gloves. Look at Ephesians 6.14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So righteousness is gauntlets in one verse and it's a breastplate in another verse. Is the Holy Spirit just confused? And of course we know the answer is that that's obviously not the case. So this must be intentional, obviously, right? So what is it trying to tell us? I trow not, quoting the King James. Here's what I think the significance is. What scripture is saying by the use of different similitudes is don't focus on the particular piece of armor, focus on the spiritual quality. In other words, it's not the issue that the hope of salvation is a helmet and it functions like that particular piece of armor. It's the spiritual quantity, quality of hope. So let's look at this again. You ready? So this is the same list we looked at before. But what I've done there is I've highlighted the spiritual component. So I've, I've left, I haven't highlighted the armor itself, but just the spiritual component. So we see there that there's truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, hope, the spirit, the word of God. So now I want to ask you a question. As you look at those qualities, what occurs to you that they all have in common? There's something that they all have. So here's what I'm going to suggest it is. The spiritual armor is produced 100% by the Holy Spirit. So look with me, get Ephesians 5.9. I just want to walk through this with you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. 
Well, now when we think of the fruit of the Spirit, it's very common to think of Galatians 5. For whatever reason, that passage is best known for the fruit of the Spirit. But it's not the only fruit of the Spirit passage in the Scriptures. Ephesians 5, 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And so we see that both truth and righteousness are fruit of the Spirit. Get with me Galatians 5.22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So with the first four aspects of the armor, they're specifically said to be fruit of the Spirit. So we can be very confident they're produced by the Spirit. But then what about the other two? What about salvation? Well, look at me at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. Ephesians 6, 7 refers to the helmet of salvation. When you look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, notice this, the hope of salvation. So the idea of of the helmet pertains to hope. And if we look at Galatians 5.5, What is it that allows us to hope, that empowers us with regard to hope? Galatians chapter 5, verse 5. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And then the last one, the Spirit, the Word of God, that obviously is connected to the Spirit because it just comes right out and tells you that it is. So what does this mean? The armor of God is 100%, as best I can tell, produced by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit equips us for the spiritual warfare that we are going to engage in. We're not going to be able to be successful simply by gutting it out in the flesh. We won't be successful doing that. Victory in spiritual warfare will be produced by the Holy Spirit or not at all. So what we're going to uh, then be looking at is this. Putting on the armor, I would suggest to you, is about walking in the Spirit. The weapons of our warfare are about the Holy Spirit enabling us to be victorious. So that is the uh, overview of the things that we're going to cover. So let me talk just briefly about uh, what we're going to cover the rest of the weekend, Brian and, and Greg and I. And I'm, you've been really good, so I'm going to let you go a little early. So, well done. But here, here are the upcoming topics. After this overview, we're going to look at the details of the armor of God. So we'll look at the different uh, aspects of the armor and the different spiritual qualities. And we'll see how those different pieces of the armor equip us to stand and withstand how to engage in the warfare and and be victorious. Then we'll look at prayer as an essential component of the Christian life. And then we'll conclude by looking at the thought life, which I'll suggest to you is the most important of the topics that we'll cover. So that's a preview of coming attractions. Uh, Thank you for your attention. I'll close us in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for your word, we thank you that the Holy Spirit equips us for all that you would have us to do. We thank you for all that you've given us in in Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, I don't think I've ever witnessed Dave leaving time on the table. So mark it down, Stephanie. All right, it's a great crowd here. Uh, We'll take a break. It looks like we'll have about a half an hour to uh, fellowship. Make sure you get something to eat, something to drink.
And we'll be back in here for the next session at 745. We're just going to stick to the original schedule. So if you came in late and you need to use the bathroom or what have you, you got a half an hour. Make sure you get up, greet one another. Uh, appreciate all of you being here this evening. Dave, uh, thanks for the uh, open.